Good evening and welcome to Horizonte, a show that takes a look at current issues through a Hispanic lens. I'm your host, Catherine Anaya. Tonight, we take a look at the status of undocumented students who are attending school in what is being called a post-DACA period. DACA is the Obama-era program that gave young people brought here illegally as children protection from deportation. But DACA applications have not been accepted for nearly three years, and the average age of the DACA recipient is in the late 20s. I will talk to a member of Aliento, a Phoenix-based advocacy group that fights for undocumented students and families. But first, the group recently held an education day where undocumented students went to the state capitol to fight for their rights. Concrete reporter Ripley Simone Kinnebrew tells us more. Dozens of students arrived at the Capitol professionally dressed to meet with lawmakers to plead their causes. There were three main goals of Aliento at the legislature this year. The first, revising state law to make undocumented and DACA students eligible for occupational and professional licenses. Are their ability to get occupational licenses, especially for dreamers and undocumented students that want to go into nursing, want to go into construction, or want to go into engineering. Right now, they cannot get a license uh, to, to uh, pull forward with their profession. So we're getting them to school already. Why not allow them to get that professional license if they meet all the, all the criteria? Another goal, making college more affordable. Jose Patino says it's heartbreaking when motivated students can't get ahead. Because you spend 16 years of your life in public education, but also in college, and you do all-nighters, and you do all this stuff, and then you see your friends on, on social media, on Instagram, and they're doing internships, and they're working here, but you can't because you don't have that nine-digit number. And the last, they want young people to have access to driver's licenses. The biggest issue is driver's license because they have either, they have students who are undocumented or they have parents. Uh, who they themselves are undocumented, and there's something that they worry about every day. Joining me now is Mario Montoya, a research analyst and coalition consultant for Alienta. Thank you so much for joining us. We appreciate you being here. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Good to see you. So the legality of the program, the DACA program, has been challenged in the courts recently, especially the last couple of years. Can you bring us up to speed on where it stands in the courts? Yeah, so there's there's currently a law a lawsuit in Texas that they filed, and what occurred? Um, they're challenging the legality of the program. When Biden came into the presidency, what he did, he tried to address some of those concerns, some legal concerns, by fixing some of the administrative issues that it was having or being challenged in the courts, right? Mm -hmm. And when he did that, the Fifth Court of Appeals decided to send it back to the Texas federal judge. And he recently decided on it, saying that the program still remains unlawful. So we're waiting for it to continue the process, go back to the Fifth Court of Appeals, and possibly the Supreme Court as well. Mm -hmm. uh, throughout this time, the program received an injunction, meaning that no new, nap new, no new applicants would be able to receive the protections and the work authorization granted by DACA since about 2021. So that's where it stands right now. The U.S. Supreme Court could ultimately decide its fate. What does this standstill, so to speak, mean for undocumented students, especially high schoolers, who are going to be graduating? Yeah, so the decision of DACA affects us here at the state level in many ways. To begin with, we have about 22,000 DACA recipients here in our state. About 85% of those DACA recipients are currently in our labor force. So if this program would be coming to an end, these are a lot of your coworkers that you're going to be losing, right? People that are going to be left without jobs. The average age of DACA recipients right now in our state, it's 30 years of age. So they're not children anymore. They're people that have built their lives, have bought homes, maybe even have U.S. citizen children themselves. So it would greatly affect our communities. And as far as the students that are graduating high school, these students are not able to have access to this program. So they don't have the work authorization and they don't have the protection from deportation that DACA recipients get just because they were not the required 15 years of age before the program shut down. I want to remind our viewers about Proposition 308 here in Arizona. It passed in November of 2022, giving undocumented students access to in-state tuition and scholarships. But what about the part that allows them to get tuition and financial aid from state universities and community colleges? Has that been implemented yet? 
Yeah, we've been working with colleges and universities here in our state. Rolling out a, a change of procedures comes with its issues, correct? So it's been some challenges in the road. Uh, I remain hopeful that we'll be able to address all those challenges and ensure that these students that are part of our Sono community that are now eligible for the in-state tuition and the state-funded aid to go to college. Because at the end of the day, having an educated population in our state benefits all of us. Absolutely. And just to be clear, under Prop 308, you don't have to be a DACA recipient to be entitled to access, correct? That is correct. So the requirements for Prop 308 eligibility is as long as you graduated from an Arizona high school and attended that school for a minimum of two years or received its equivalent, you should have access to Prop 308 uh, in-state tuition. So going back to what you were talking about in this this situation that um, these students find themselves in, can you go into uh, a little in depth about the challenges and the barriers and the uncertainty that these students face right now? Yeah. So for myself, I'm a DACA recipient. So currently there's about 10,000 uh, DACA eligible um, individuals here in Arizona that can't apply to the program. Where that puts those individuals, it puts them in a place of uncertainty. Uh, having to drive to work, to school, or church, it's, it's something that gives you anxiety because you don't have that protection from deportation, correct? And it makes it harder as well to be able to work in the field that maybe you went to school to do. Like if you graduated, you don't, for, to be a nurse, you don't necessarily have the work authorization to be able to live out those dreams and give back to your community. Well, you're in this limbo phase, and you mentioned that you are a DACA recipient and you also are an ASU graduate. Congratulations. Talk to me a little bit about the kind of emotional toll that this takes when you are in a situation like this, the, the fear that sometimes arises with just not knowing, you know, from two years to the next two years what your situation is going to be. It's very challenging. It's like having to renew a subscription each two years just to be able to be here and be able to work, right? It comes with anxieties of not knowing if maybe my application is going to take longer than usual and I might be in the place where I don't have work authorization or I can't work. So it, it's, it's hard to live like that and it's more challenging to see all the students that should be eligible, but unfortunately don't have access to it because for them, they don't have the opportunity of that work authorization and they don't have the opportunity of that protection from deportations as well. So what's next as far as community advocacy and support from the community? How can people get involved? Yeah, so I suggest everyone to check out our website, go to alientoac.org. We offer a bunch of opportunities to volunteer. Uh, if you know any students that need the resources, there's resources for undocumented or documented students as well. Uh, please, if you can volunteer your time as well, we'll greatly appreciate that. And if you have the means, donating is how we do our work. So that would also be greatly appreciated. And just to wrap up this conversation, if you could just explain to people um, in the big picture what kind of an impact this has on Arizona's economy and workforce. Yeah, th these people have built their life here. Like I mentioned before, there are coworkers, there are neighbors to remove their work authorization or not allow them to work or just try to like remove them from our community will have a huge impact. These are people that are giving back to the community, that are paying their taxes and that are helping us out. So it's it'll be noticeable if we try to push these people away. Absolutely. Mario, thank you so much for joining me. And the work that Aliento is doing is so critical. And I appreciate you sharing that with our viewers as well. And I want to remind folks they can go to alientoaz.org if they want to support or get involved in what you're doing. Thank you. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. That's our show for tonight for Horizonte and Arizona PBS. I'm Catherine Anaya. Thanks for joining us. Have a great night.